Oral questions by members? Member for Surrey South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In 2018, the BC Centre on Substance Use released a report called Strategies to Strengthen Recovery in British Columbia. It offered a plan for recovery-oriented system of care. But the NDP government rejected this work, led by Dr. Evan Wood, even scrubbing the report from the Centre's website. Tragically, over 8,900 people have died of drug toxicity since then. To the Premier, why did the NDP government reject the 2018 plan and deny thousands of people struggling from addiction with the critical help that they need? Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Honourable Speaker, and I thank the member uh, for, for her question on a topic that I know is of great concern to everyone in this House, to all British Columbians, to everyone in our communities. And indeed, our government since 2017, uh, through our 10-year roadmap articulated in the Pathway to Hope, has been building out a, an integrated system of care for people who are struggling with substance use. That uh, it has involved a ramping up of treatment beds. We've, we have built over 360 treatment beds. We have now in the province have over 3,200 uh, treatment beds for people struggling with, with substance use. In every respect, across the entire continuum of care, we are building out community counselling um, services. We are investing in child and youth uh, mental health. We are investing in, in treatment and recovery. We know how important it is, and we are going to stand with British Columbians on their individual paths to recovery. Member for Supplemental. Yes, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for the response. And it is unfortunate that over 11,000 people have died and that the rollout of beds really equates to in the nearly six years that this government has been operating, that it's really only added three treatment beds a month in British Columbia. Alberta successfully implemented a recovery-oriented system of care and drastically reduced the number of deaths based on the same report that this NDP government rejected. The Premier could look to Alberta to see what BC could have achieved if this government had acted on the 2018 report. But when I attended the recovery conference in Calgary last week with experts, and ministers from across the country, nobody from this government was there. Jeez. Again to the Premier, why has this NDP government failed to prioritize critical treatment and recovery services for nearly six years? Minister. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. Um, I, I think there's, there, there is no question that, British, the question that British Columbians understand that when we talk about the, uh, the, the dramatic toll that the toxic drug poisoning crisis in this province has taken, that the work that we are doing uh, with respect to harm reduction is absolutely critical in, in addressing that because we know we have to keep people alive in order to connect them to treatment. I have heard that time and time again from people with lived experiences. We have heard that from the families who have had loved ones who have died. Uh, with respect to, uh, uh, to our achievements, I do want to talk about, I want to talk about the work that we did from 2017 to 2019, ramping up harm reduction interventions, ramping up treatment supports, ramping up an anti-stigma campaign that all contributed to dramatically reduce the mortality rate, dramatically. In 2019, we saw a dramatic reduction members, in the number members. of people who died due to toxic drug poisoning, demonstrating that the work that we had laid out in our plan was working. That is the work that we are going to continue members. to do. We are going to continue to work hard with frontline providers, with our partners and health authorities, with physicians, with community partners to regain the ground that we lost due to the COVID pandemic. And I will say that when it comes to where good ideas come from, there are good ideas coming from all over the place. And I was very pleased that staff from the Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions. Please continue. 
I was very pleased that staff from the Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions were able to take part in the conference, of El, uh, uh, in the conference that occurred in Alberta so that we can take those learnings as well. Thank you very much, Honourable Speaker. Member for Prince George Wilmount. Well, thank you. And what the Minister failed to recognize is that every single day in British Columbia, we hear from families who have loved ones who want and need access to treatment. And here's the reality. They simply cannot get it. That's the reality. And I'm relieved to hear the Minister say that they're willing to uh, look at good ideas, because that is exactly what we and the Leader of the Opposition are suggesting. We need to see a dramatic shift in this province that will prioritize treatment and recovery. And what did this minister say when we outlined a plan that would do just that? It's nothing but a distraction. Even more concerning is the NDP's ally, Press Progress, which is financed, as I know the Premier knows, by the Broadbent Institute, is spreading harmful and offensive claims that addictions treatment is, and I quote, not really medicine, end quote. Press Progress and the Broadbent Institute are even attacking recovery experts and pushing theories, and again I quote, that addiction treatment represents a tip of the spear on privatized medicine, end quote. That is harmful, it is offensive, and it needs to stop. So will the Premier, do the right thing today and publicly denounce these harmful and offensive attacks on addictions treatment. Minister Members, Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honourable Speaker. And I, and I thank the member for her question. I do want to also thank the member for her work on the Select Standing Committee. I think that was um, an important example of what British Columbians expect from all of us in this space, given the unprecedented nature of the uh, public health emergency that is the toxic drug um, poisoning crisis in, in our province. And, you know, I, I, what I would say is that we, we are taking our advice from experts, as we have always done. The work that our government did in the 90s on this file, the work that we have done from 2017 is informed by experts. It's informed by the remarkable people who work in our health authorities, uh, the addiction medicine specialists, the, the, the folks in public health who are supporting uh, the harm reduction um, strategies to try to keep people alive, to try to keep people alive who are struggling with a condition that is a chronic and relapsing condition, as we all know as we all know, a chronic and relapsing condition that may require many, 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 many tries at treatment before they, that they are successful. We have to be there for people all the way through the continuum, all the way through their path. And it, it, it is, our, our path is absolutely supported by a $55 million investment in integrated child and youth teams, which are going to help pull together mental health supports, uh, uh, health, health, care, health authority supports, mental health and addiction, addiction supports to support kids in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in schools. That is the work that we are absolutely laser focused on, Honourable Speaker. Member for Prince George Wilmore, supplemental. Well, thank you very much. And while I appreciate the Minister's comments about the work of the Health Committee, what we would have preferred to see instead of a motion that's going to potentially take up time in the Legislature is an action plan that takes up the recommendations that were made by all parties in this Legislature. I can, I can tell the, the Minister was uncomfortable talking about the Broadbent Institute. Well, the Premier can't claim ignorance when it comes to that organization. He only needs to consult with his top political advisor, Matt Smith. Smith's immediate past job before joining the Premier's office last fall was to provide, uh, to quote his resume, fundraising advice for the Broadbent Institute, end quote. The government's news release announcing Smith's appointment even quoted the Broadbent Institute endorsing him. It is so upsetting to see someone who is basically running the Premier's office doing nothing about the attacks on treatment 
and recovery providers. Today, the Premier has the opportunity to do the right thing. First of all, adopt the Better Is Possible plan and take a stand against the attacks that are being made on treatment and recovery providers. Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. And I, I just I, I mean I have to say that we, we do we do have a plan and we've been executing that plan. We've been taking action on that plan since 2017. We have been making substantial investments of hundreds of millions of dollars in treatment. We all agree. We all agree in this House on the importance of connecting people to the services that they need. Please continue. That is why we have uh, opened, uh, last year alone, 105 treatment beds that have already helped 624 people. We have new outpatient out withdrawal management Minister, services. Mr. Holden, when the question was being asked by the member from Prince George Wilmont, the other side was very courteous. They listened to the question. Now let's provide the same courtesy to hear the answer, please. Minister will continue. We have, uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. We have new outpatient withdrawal management services across the Interior Health Authority, new treatment and stabilization beds in places like Kamloops, Kelowna, and Lillawat. We have new sobering beds in Port Hardy. We are making strides every day to ramp up services, including upstream uh, for children and youth, for adults ac uh, accessing counselling programs. We know we have to act across the entire continuum. There is no dispute on this side of the House, Honourable Speaker, about the importance of treatment and recovery on that, on that spectrum. Uh, it, it is not helpful to try and create divisions where, in fact, there are none. We have a plan which we will continue to work with, and we are very, very grateful to work with all parties uh, to, uh, to, to make progress on this very pressing issue for British Columbians. Leader of the Third Party. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. Thousands of people gathered here at the Legislature on Saturday, including Neil Young, to show their support for old growth protection in BC. And while this government has made some important changes, old growth trees continue to fall, and the situation is dire. The spotted owl population, a species dependent on old growth forests, is down to just one bird left in the wild. One bird. Yet logging continues in spotted owl habitat. 448 cut blocks were recently approved or await approval by this government in spotted owl habitat. This government approves logging while breeding spotted owls in captivity to prevent them from going extinct. It's not unlike shooting wolves to save caribou while continuing to destroy caribou habitat. The Federal Minister of Environment and Climate Change, Stephen Gilbo, is now recommending an emergency order to protect spotted owls because BC is not stepping up. If approved, this will be the third time in Canadian history where an emergency order has been issued to protect an endangered species. This isn't the first time the federal government has had to step up to correct this government's failures. They stepped in to protect caribou, to protect wild salmon, and to monitor tex environmental disasters along the Elk River. Question member. Honourable Speaker, my question for you is to the Premier. When will he commit to implementing biodiversity <coughs> legislation? Minister of Forest. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, protecting and promoting the recovery of threatened species in British Columbia is a top priority for this government. We're doing everything we can to help spotted owls recover, including running the world's only captive breeding and release program for this endangered species. We've protected more than 281,000 hectares of spotted owl habitat an area equivalent to 700 Stanley Parks. This is enough to support a future population of 125 breeding pairs. In addition, we have put in place additional deferrals 
in two Fraser Canyon watersheds, the Utsalis and Spasm watersheds, to help protect spotted owl habitat and ensure no logging takes place in these old growth forests. Leader of, <laughs> Leader of the Third Party Supplemental. Honorable Speaker, thank you very much. Wow, we are down to one bird in the wild, and this government thinks that that's something to celebrate as a success story. That is astonishing, Honorable Speaker. And it wasn't the question I asked. I asked the question to the Premier whether there would be biodiversity legislation or species at risk protection legislation. In fact, work on that legislation started in 2017 because it was promised by this party in the 2017 election that they would introduce species at risk legislation. And the work started, but the people that were working on that legislation were told to stop working. And I'm very curious to know who told those people to stop working on the legislation that was promised by this government to the people of British Columbia. My question again for you, Honourable Speaker, is to the Premier. Will he commit to introducing biodiversity legislation? Because it's not like we're debating any other legislation in this House right now. <laughs> Minister of Environment. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honourable Speaker. Thank you to the member for the question. As I'm pretty sure the member knows, when we began working on, at that time, species at risk legislation for BC, the first thing we did was begin a series of consultations with First Nations, who very quickly made it clear to us that they needed to be involved in the uh, development, discussion of the legislation at every stage of the way. My colleague, the, uh, the Minister of Forests, has talked about the, uh, the work that we've done in partnership with the federal government and First Nations with respect to deferring logging in, uh, in the old growth habitat while we await the results of a captive breeding program and ensure that we can protect spotted owls. But of course, there are many species, and that is why we entered into, at the same time we made the agreement with the federal government, the negotiation of a nature agreement, a comprehensive nature agreement with the federal government by which we could take steps to deal with ecosystem integrity. Again, Honourable Speaker, we are working with that, as we should, with First Nations around the province to ensure that it is government to government to government, and we get it right. Our government has committed to implement all of the recommendations of the Old Growth Strategic Review. That includes enacting biodiversity legislation. That is being done and worked on by my colleague, the Minister of Water, Land and Resource Stewardship, in conjunction with First Nations, as we must and as we should. Opposition House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, the Cowichan Hospital Replacement Project is already uh, well over uh, three years behind schedule, and it's a shocking $850 million uh, over budget. But, Mr. Speaker, if you thought that this boondoggle uh, was bad enough, last week we heard the NDP express only a half-truth with respect to the current proposed cost on the Royal BC's uh, museum's uh, uh, warehousing facility in Colwood. Instead, of that facility being $46 billion uh, over the, uh, the initial budget estimate, which uh, the NDP would have British Columbians believe, the actual budget is now nearly double that. Costs have ballooned to a staggering $93 million over budget, and it's two years behind schedule. And Mr. Speaker, they haven't even broken ground and started construction on this project yet. Headlines are already proclaiming the return of NDP budget budgets, and we haven't even made it to the budget tomorrow. Mr. Speaker, my question is this. Uh, if the NDP are applying this level of spin to the museum boondoggle, how can British Columbians have any trust in tomorrow's budget numbers? Minister of Tourism, Arts and Culture.
thank you for the question. And um, I can tell the member that I was very happy about the announcement last week because it means that we're ready to move forward, break ground this summer and get a very important building up and going to house our over 7 million artifacts and shared history of British Columbia. So in July 2020, the original budget came out. Uh, and I will admit that there was an increase, and that was also revealed in an announcement that came out. So I don't expect the member to follow along uh, on budget announcements, but I can say that two and a half years ago, two and a half years ago, um, we were asked to go back and find energy efficiencies, use the lens of Clean BC to come back with a very sustainable plan. We did that. And then the announcement last week was a reflection of the cost of doing business these days, which I am sure the members understand. So we have now landed on a fixed price contract with two excellent companies. One Canadian firm that is known for its sustainability design and an architect, from, uh, an architect firm from Vancouver that is also uh, well known for its sustainability. So from this project, we will not only protect our shared uh, interests in 7 million artifacts, but we're also going to find that about 1,000 direct and indirect jobs will come of this, and we have room for 25 years of growth. On this side of the house, we believe that protecting our shared history is important, and I would hope that the other side would as well. Opposition House Leader Supplemental. <laughs> Well, Mr. Speaker, only the NDP would call a, a $100 million cost escalation on a project a sustainable plan. <laughs> a, a sustainable plan for a project that nobody asked for and nobody wants, $100 million more than the original budget. The collections building was supposed to cost $177 million, and it was supposed to be completed by next year, 2024. But as I said a moment ago, it's already nearly $100 million, or 52% over budget, and construction hasn't started. Meanwhile, downtown, you know, here in Victoria, the, the museum has been half gutted for 15 months since the government abruptly closed down Old Town and the entire third floor. British Columbians deserve better than a half-empty museum in Victoria and an empty field in Colwood. Mr. Speaker, my question uh, to the Premier is this. When will the Premier admit that the collections facility is a complete and utter boondoggle, when will he scrap this project and instead do a modest upgrade of the museum across the street, including the reopening of Old Town and the entire third floor? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I, I do uh, have a different opinion than the member. I think people do want us to be able to house our 7 million artifacts of shared history uh, and protect that. I think British Columbians understand that for the past many years there's been great concern about the archives and the fact that a lot of our really important documents are stored under sea level. That is not ideal and we risk losing this, these important documents of our history. I'm not sure the member also understands the scope of what we're talking about. This, uh, this building out on the West Shore will be an amazing place, not just for storing our 7 million artifacts, but there's opportunities for education, K through, K through 12, there's uh, post-secondary educational activities, and there will also be incredible research opportunities. This will be uh, something that we will see international visitors come for. These 7 million artifacts are very diverse. They go from an 11,000 artifact uh, collection from Emily Carr, but we also have an incredible amount of other types of artifacts. The member might not know this, but we do have uh, an artifact called Buster. This is a ferrosaurus, otherwise known as the Iron Lizard of the Sustat River. It is the first unique species of dinosaur found and identified in British Columbia. Those are things we need to protect and we need to be able to show British Columbians what they have. Members. Members, members, members. Sorry, White Rock. 
Member for Surrey White Rock. When the Premier made changes to his office, Laurie Wanamaker, the Deputy Minister of the Premier, was paid a $600,000 severance. On the same day, she was appointed to BC Hydro that now pays $93,000. This isn't severance, it's double dipping. Will the Premier personally take responsibility for his decision to hand out an obscene severance to have that person employed in the government on the same day? Premier. Thank you very much, Honourable Speaker. Say uh, it's uh, it's an honor. I just crossed the 100-day uh, threshold as premier, premier of this province. So premier. Member for Columbia River Ravelstoke, please. Premier will continue. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I uh, just crossed the 100-day threshold as premier of this province, and it's been a great honor every single day. I see as a, a privilege and opportunity to deliver for British Columbians on health care, on housing, on public safety and a clean economy that works for everybody. Uh, making sure that we have a strong team uh, at BC Hydro. It's hard to think of a more important time for BC Hydro, frankly, uh, when we're facing a climate crisis and need to electrify our economy, uh, when we're looking at the economic advantages that BC has around uh, the ability to deliver firm power uh, and uh, reduce emissions by electrifying uh, people's homes, switching from fuels that contribute to climate change, but also industry, uh, and driving industry by delivering uh, affordable, reliable power. Uh, having Lori as uh, chair of the board uh, is going to be uh, critically important. She served under both sides of this house. She started in uh, the Office of the Auditor General. Uh, she was uh, deputy at the Minister of Finance for many years. Uh, she is an accountant. She is an exceptional leader, and I am so glad she's agreed to take on this job. Member for Surrey White Rock Supplemental. And thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, you know, for the Premier to get up and, and speak about his hundred days. It's been a hundred days of hot air for British Columbians. <laughs> To the to the pre to the premier. Members, it's a bit sensitive. To the premier, there is a difference between severance and double dipping. Laurie Wanamaker collected the massive severance, but continued in a job paid for by taxpayers. The premier handed out six hundred thousand dollars of severance with one hand, while giving a job with the other all on the same day. How does the Premier justify this outrageous so-called severance for someone who did not even leave the government? Premier. Thanks, Honourable Speaker. And, uh, and I thank the member for the opportunity to uh, run through a few of our accomplishments as a government in the first 100 days. <laughs> Members, sure was watching his members, please, members, you asked a question, that's enough. Member for Abbotsford West, member for Abbotsford West, please. Premier will continue. Thanks, Honourable Speaker. The, uh, I'm sure the member was watching as we announced uh, $400 million for uh, the first phase of a 10-year cancer plan, faster treatment, for British Columbians across the province, including regional cancer centers. I'm, I'm sure the member was watching uh, when we, well, in fact, he was here when we passed legislation setting targets for local government, when we announced a half a billion dollar plan to protect tenants in low cost rental housing. I'm sure the member, I'm sure the member is well aware on public safety when we established peer response teams to take the pressure off police to respond to people in mental health crisis, teams of prosecutors, police and probation officers around repeat violent offenders. When the federal government agreed with us, they need to change the rules around bail to protect communities. I'm sure we was watching when we had $180 million for a manufacturing fund for a clean economy when we uh, added 100 jobs back to the mill in Crofton. It was closed. Just this weekend, the second affordability credit for BC residents for up to $410 per family and $500 million to stabilize BC ferry fares uh, in the face of rising costs. I know, I know the member.
member knows. I know the member knows we have legal obligations around severance that we have to meet when people leave government. I know he knows that BC Hydro is independent of government, and it's good that it works that way. But we have those obligations. I'm so glad that Laurie agreed to take on this vital job as chair at BC Hydro, because to deliver on things like this, to continue to deliver, we need leaders like her chairing that board, not political appointments like they did every single time they had the chance. Member for Kamloops, North Thompson. Well, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, let's be clear. The, the cancer announcement was actually part of the 2020 election promise by the former Premier. It was actually supposed to be fully implemented by now. So in the NDP land, I guess taking three years to start a 10-year plan is considered a success, as people are waiting for cancer treatment, of all things. Here. A college and hospital that's been delayed and now is over twice as expensive as when it was first announced is considered a success by this government. A collections building that's $100 million over budget and delayed is considered a success. And now we have the Premier trying to deflect away his questions about severance. It seems money's never an object when it comes to this Premier's office. We have the $600,000 of severance, which also triggered a new government job on the very same day. We have the former Chief of Staff, Jeff Meigs, walking away with $340,000. And then we have Amber Hawking, an NDP insider who accepted the job as the Premier's Deputy Chief of Staff, this Premier's Deputy Chief of Staff, but resigned very shortly afterwards and, and explained a payout of $190,000. What? Now, she resigned. And in her resignation letter, she stated that she wanted to, quote, move on to another chapter in my life, one that is filled with grandkids and hobbies, end quote, and no one can fault someone for that. But it's a resignation, Mr. Speaker, after only a few weeks on the job. Can the minister, or the premier, please explain why that still triggered a $190,000 severance payment? Premier. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. The member knows we have legal obligations in relation to personnel. Uh, we meet those legal obligations and all policies are followed. Wow. Yeah.